Hello, Hi Rock. I'm glad you're joining us today. Now, I grew up locally in Concord, Mass, home of the Old North Bridge, where the famous shot heard round the world ignited the American Revolution. But long before guns were fired, the battle lines were drawn when the Declaration of Independence was drafted, denouncing the King of England and declaring independence from his unrighteous rule. Endorsing the Declaration was considered treason by the British government, but undeterred, Massachusetts Representative John Hancock was the first to step forward and sign it with large, legible letters, thus renouncing any obligations to England. Now, he was a, an educated, wealthy man who could have prospered under the current regime. But he believed in American ideals like democracy, freedom of speech, freedom of religion. So he risked not only his privileges, but even his life to join the revolution. To this day, we admiringly remember him and, and the other signatories to that document. Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, Samuel Adams. But when you hear these names listed, you never hear the name Swaim among them. You might have. My family was a part of the revolutionary struggle. The Mayflower, after leaving Britain, spent several years in Holland before venturing across the Atlantic. So that fleet and those that followed carried many Dutch passengers, including my ancestors, the Van Pelts. According to family lore, when the British crown tried asserting control in the colonies, many indignant Dutch settlers formed an insurgency movement and received tattoos with the initials of their mutinous motto, sworn to withhold allegiance from invading monarchs. I used to be proud to be associated with such principled, persecuted people, until I discovered why our name was switched from Van Pelt to Swaim. When these revolutionaries were captured by British troops, rather than stand up for their convictions, some would hide behind the very tattoos that were supposed to declare their defiance. But no, officer, he, you see, I'm not one of those seditious Van Pelts. My, my name is uh, Swaim. Whenever I meet other Swaims for the first time, they tell the same story, usually with an air of pride. But perhaps we should be more embarrassed because those of us who are Swaims today are simply the descendants of those who lacked the courage to live out what they claimed to believe. The reason you've never heard of Senator Swaim or you know, Pastor Dave Pale Ale is that despite all their tough talk, when their convictions became costly, my ancestors wimped out. They believed in the American ideals, but they believed even more in British bayonets. They believed in freedom, but in the moment of decision, they chose to fit in. Trying to play both sides, they received neither the, the fleeting benefits of full cooperation with those in power, nor the enduring rewards reserved for true revolutionaries. I share this story because just like my ancestors believed in democracy, Many of us believe in God. In the words of the Apostles' Creed, not Apollo Creed, the Apostles' Creed, our most ancient and widely embraced declaration of faith, Christians believe that he's the Almighty Father, creator of heaven and earth. But we also believe in comfort and convenience. We believe that Jesus Christ, his only Son, suffered, was crucified, dead, and buried. But we also believe that suffering hurts, and we want to avoid it at all costs. We believe in resurrection from the dead, but we haven't renounced our allegiance to pleasure, popularity, grudges, or greed, because we believe in those things too. We believe in God, but we trust in good grades, good looks, good incomes, or just a good time. Maybe this isn't you, but it was me. Several years after accepting that 
I believed that Christianity was true, I was driving home from a youth group on my way to a party with my school friends. Now, Jesus loved parties, but I'm pretty sure that this was not the kind of party that Jesus would enjoy as much. Coincidentally, I was driving on the old battle road between Concord and Lexington, and I was thinking about how disappointed I was with my life, with my faith. I mean, it should have been great because I'd found a clever compromise between loving others and looking out for myself, between doing God's will and doing my will, between being holy and being happy, between being set apart and fitting in, between following Christ and following the crowd. I try to strike a, a reasonable compromise so that I can enjoy, enjoy the benefits of both, but it wasn't working. Instead, my spiritual life felt empty, and, and I was missing out on, on some of the things my school friends insisted were the most fun. I felt cheated. Friends, many of us secretly believe that we can put on a red coat and Minute Man pants and reap the benefits of belonging to both sides, but in fact, we belong to neither, so we just get shot at from both sides. So many of us want to be faithful to God, but like my ancestors, the Swames, in the moment of decision, we give into our greed, lust, and fear. And that's exactly what some of the earliest Christians were doing 30 years after the death and resurrection of Christ. They loved Jesus, and their lives had been changed by Jesus. We see in Hebrews 10 that they'd even endured suffering and persecution in order to be faithful to Jesus. We read, think back on those early days when you first learned about Christ. Remember how you remained faithful even though it meant terrible suffering. Sometimes you were exposed to public ridicule and were beaten, and sometimes you helped others who were suffering those same things. You suffered along with those who were thrown in jail. And when all you owned was taken from you, you accepted it with joy. You knew there were better things waiting for you that will last forever. They'd seen what Jesus could do, and they knew what he promised. So they were willing to stand with him even when it was costly. But as time wore on, and the threat of ridicule or persecution continued, their faith in God was compromised by their fear of people. Likewise, many of us love Jesus deeply and have been changed by him. I am routinely encouraged by the, the courage and compassion I, I see in many high rockers who sacrifice to serve Christ and those in need. I, I could tell so many inspiring stories about people in this church. We believe he makes a difference and is worth living for. But sometimes we get afraid. Sometimes, as much as we want to be like Christ, we also want to be liked, successful, comfortable, and keep up with the Joneses. We want what only God can give, but we also want everything the world can offer. Some of you came to Boston to attend elite universities or work at successful companies and are afraid of being perceived as backward or bigoted by identifying with Jesus in that intimidating environment. You have faith, but you want to fit in. Some of you are in relationships or situations where you feel tempted to compromise God's commandments about your money, sexuality, or honesty. Some of you are afraid to share what you believe because you're afraid you'll lose followers on social media or maybe even your job. You love God, but your faith is held captive by your fear. Can you think of any place in your life where you know what God wants? The God who loves you and knows what's best for you. You know what God wants, and yet you don't really do it because you're afraid you might miss out on something the world could offer. Jesus warned that we should expect suffering in this broken world. But when we actually experience that suffering, 
some Christians begin wondering if it's still worth following Jesus. I mean, what's the point if I still end up struggling with marriage or money, a miscarriage or some, some other source of pain? These challenges are real. And, and the stakes are even higher in other parts of the world where following Jesus requires literally risking your life. Globally, approximately 6,000 Christians are martyred each year. That's an average of 16 of our Christian brothers and sisters murdered every single day simply because they follow Jesus. Every day. And 360, 360 million more Christians are denied basic human rights because of their faith. Is it really worth it to follow Jesus? You know, for the earliest Christians, this was not just a hypothetical question. They'd experienced Jesus' power, and they believed in his promises about eternal life. But for the first generations of believers, to publicly profess faith in Jesus was to risk being disowned by their families, kicked out of their communities, and even executed in the town squares or Roman arenas. And knowing the costs, they believed it was worth it. Jesus alone could offer true peace and genuine joy and eternal life. So when they were baptized, they courageously declared their faith in the God they'd come to know, the God they'd come to trust in even the darkest valleys, and the God they'd come to love even more than their own lives. Just before being baptized, they professed boldly, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, and so on. That's the origin of what we now call the Apostles' Creed. It's been tweaked slightly since first being used during Roman baptisms in 95 AD. But today, that same creed is recited in churches all over the globe sometimes every single Sunday, to remind us of what a Christian really is. Regardless of our many differences in language, culture, country, social class, skin color, political positions, worship styles, and, and whatever else distinguishes us, this creed points to what binds us together, our shared devotion to the Heavenly Father who created us, came as Jesus to save us, and whose Holy Spirit now lives inside us. And this shared devotion propels us to love everyone made in God's image and to care for the world God created. As we do every decade at High Rock, this fall we'll be studying the Apostles' Creed phrase by phrase in order to be reminded once again of what it actually means to be a Christian. And we'll begin today with the declaration, I believe. Because misunderstanding this will make us miss what this creed is supposed to be. Many Christians assume the Apostles' Creed is just a, a boring list of arcane religious doctrines. When I started attending a church that read the Apostles' Creed during services, I'd look ahead at each article to ascertain whether I agreed with it before I said it. Jesus Christ? Yeah, I, I believe in him. The Holy Catholic Church? We're not Catholics, are we? What does that mean? I'm just going to keep my mouth shut on that line. This approach reduces the creed to a catalog of Christian certainties. You know, other people believe in karma, the Buddha, Keynesian economics, fate, rabbit's feet, horoscopes, or UFOs. But we believe in God, the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. But that's not what this is. Just consider what's missing. Not even one word about the Bible, atonement, prayer, or communion. I mean, these are essential elements of Christianity. Beyond that, Jesus' entire life between his conception and his crucifixion is reduced to a comma. So much seems to be missing from this statement of faith. On the other hand, so much is here that's missing from our faith. Many Christians believe theoretically in God's forgiveness, but don't truly receive it for our sins or extend it to others. Many say we believe in an almighty God who loves us like a father, 
but we don't live with real trust and we're full of fear. We may recite, I believe in the communion of saints, but we want to pick and choose who deserves love or attention. For Christians like these, I believe in God means little more than, I believe there may be a God out there somewhere. But the creed's not supposed to simply be a list of ideas we agree with. It's a personal pledge of allegiance to the God we believe in. It's not a dry accounting of what we think, but a passionate declaration about whom we love and live for. Today, we use the word believe to mean, I think, but I'm not so sure. I, is it going to be sunny tomorrow? I believe so, but you know, I mean, I don't really know. Do you think the Red Sox can make it to the playoffs? I believe so, but I'm not going to bet my life on it. Today, believe is a very weak word. It's become the opposite of certainty. It means little more than wish. But the Latin word credo, translated I believe, which is the first word in the Apostles' Creed, is very different. And the English word believe used to be very different too. Believe comes from the German word believen, meaning to love. So originally, I believe described a passion, a devotion, a covenant, a vow. The difference between a list of doctrines and a creed is the difference between a marriage book and a marriage vow. A marriage book is more complete and complicated, but a relatively brief marriage vow is more powerful because it's a life-changing covenant. Regardless of whatever else may happen, I pledge to love, honor, cherish, and be faithful for the rest of my life. Likewise, the Apostles' Creed is the vow Christians in every nation and generation have taken as they enter into an eternal covenant with Christ. It's not enough to affirm that God is real and Christianity is correct. James reminds us that even the demons believe there's a God. Saying, I think it's true, doesn't make me a Christian any more than saying, I think she's amazing, makes me a husband. Noticing that Michelle is cute and kind, even realizing that I'm in love with her, is different from vowing to love her, for better or for worse, in richer and poorer, for the rest of our lives. <laughs> there was so much about Michelle that I didn't know back when I first made that vow. There are still so many things I don't understand now, but I am 100% committed to loving her for the rest of my life. A wedding vow means that every other dream and desire must defer to my primary allegiance to my wife. Even choosing to get married won't matter very much unless it affects every other choice I make from that moment on. My ancestors believed in a democratic revolution, but they weren't ready to give their lives for it. Conversely, in saying with the creed, I believe in God, I'm not affirming that there probably is a God, but, I, but giving my life to him. Jesus began his ministry by declaring, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus challenges us to renounce our allegiance to whatever currently controls us, whether it's our love for money, popularity, security, or, or simple self-interest, and transfer our citizenship to the kingdom of heaven, obeying and trusting in God rather than whatever the world has to offer. People tried to kill Jesus, not because he was promoting a religion, but because he was instigating a revolution. So when those first Christians being baptized in Rome declared, I believe, they were asserting that rather than belonging to the Roman Empire, I give myself to God. Rather than serve Caesar, I serve God. Rather than trust Rome for my future security, I trust God. Rather than seek rewards from Rome, I seek rewards from God. Rather than obeying their customs, I'm obeying God. I'm a revolutionary, 
not attacking with armies and swords, but disarming those powers with forgiveness, faith, and sacrificial love. Those baptismal candidates would never return to the drunken orgies or, or contribute to the political and commercial corruption that characterized Roman culture, because though they still lived in Rome, they were no longer Romans. They were Christians. Those baptismal candidates were revolutionaries, and like revolutionaries, when discovered, they were often imprisoned and even killed. When those Christians said, I believe, it was their proud pledge of allegiance to God's advancing kingdom, like new citizens pledging allegiance to their new nation for the first time. It was their commitment to live for Christ and even die like Christ. Because we know that the God who raised Jesus from the dead will keep his promise to raise us as well. We may suffer, but we cannot lose. The life of courage and compassion that follows that vow is what the writer of Hebrews calls faith. Faith is not mere opinion about what might be true. It's a covenant to trust and follow Jesus, even when it's costly. But seeing that the faith of those early Christians was wavering, he exhorts, do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you've done the will of God, you will receive what he's promised. And, and then he continues to encourage them in chapter 11. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see. And without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And then in the entire rest of this chapter, he lists example after example of heroes of faith. These were regular sinners, just like us, but they trusted God even when it was terrifying, so that God could use them to change the world. He mentions Noah, who built a boat in the desert just because God told him to. Everyone must have laughed at Noah for doing something so silly. But by faith, he condemned the world, meaning he stopped caring about what they said or thought. So he became an heir of righteousness that is in keeping with faith, meaning his obedience allowed, it, allowed God to use him for something spectacular. Then he points to Abraham, who had even greater faith. Noah at least had detailed directions from God about what to do and what would happen. But when God called Abraham, he obeyed and went, even though he didn't know where he was going. We know about how God used Abraham to launch a new nation and, and become the father of faith for most of the world. But he had no idea any of that could happen. He just obeyed what God instructed, even though it cost him his friendships, his home, and everything familiar. Abraham didn't know where he was going or what would happen, but he knew whom he was following. So by faith, he made his home in the promised land, like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, because he was looking forward to a city whose architect and builder is God. God had designed something that nobody else had dreamed possible. And God would do the hard work to make it a reality. On and on this list goes. Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Rahab, one inspiring story after another of ancient sinners that we call saints because they believed. They trusted God even when it was scary, confusing, or costly. Therefore, the writer of Hebrews concludes, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let's run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. Perhaps you're thinking, well, that sounds awesome, but I mean, I, I don't have that much faith. Honestly, I don't have that much faith either. But my friends, we don't need that much faith. 
Jesus said, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. His point was that we're not saved by the size or strength of our faith. We're saved by Jesus. The person with great faith in the broken ladder he's climbing is much less secure than someone with only a little faith on a solid ladder. You can suffer temptations and doubt. All you need is enough faith to keep following God even when you're intimidated or or enticed to do otherwise. And when you fail, have enough faith in God's forgiveness to get back up and keep running. The strength of my faith is not as important as the object of my faith. We're not saved by believing. We're saved by Jesus. So when I recite the Apostles' Creed, I'm not just saying I think something, but that I trust someone. So when I go to another church that recites this creed, I don't simply think, well, wow, how nice that they all agree with me. No, when I go to another church in India or, or Africa that recites this same creed, I realize that these strangers are my family. They love and live for the same God that I love and live for. We may look different, sound different, like different things, and think different things. But we have one Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, who came as Jesus Christ to save us and make us into one family. One of the courageous saints not mentioned in Hebrews 11 was Joshua, who challenged those following him, Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your forefathers worship beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Joshua is speaking to his fellow Israelites who believe God. I mean, they've seen him do miracles. But they also believe in the real benefits of sin. And they want to have both. So he explains, it's up to you. Serve the Lord or serve other agendas. But these two are at war. So sometimes you have to choose. Years ago, a certain Harvard professor was reputed to be among the world's foremost experts on lung cancer. But I used to pass him several times a week as he smoked between classes. He believed that smoking causes cancer. But he also believed that smoking felt good. Likewise, many of us really do follow Christ when that seems advantageous. At other times, we follow our peers, our pocketbooks, popularity, or pleasure. And as a swame, I'm in no position to throw stones. And that's exactly what my ancestors did. But then you can't be surprised when you fail to reap the reward reserved for true revolutionaries. We can't wear red coats with Minuteman pants and hope to receive the blessings of both. You know, we may remain angry at others, but refuse to cuss them out because we follow Christ. But then we'll experience neither the superficial satisfaction of revenge nor the enduring joy of forgiveness and reconciliation. We can give 10% of our money to the church, but spend the rest on selfish indulgences. So we get neither the fleeting pleasure of maximized materialism nor the genuine joy of true generosity. My friends, some of us need to make a choice. Wanting the best of both worlds We search for a compromise that will let us obey God without forsaking the enticements of the world, just like I was doing during my first years of following Jesus. I believed in God, but my life didn't reflect that because I also believed in the American dream, obeying my feelings, and serving myself. So that night, decades ago, as I drove along the old battle road between Concord and Lexington, thinking about how dissatisfied I was with my divided life. A song with these lyrics played. There's a wealth of things that I profess, said that I believed, but deep inside, I never changed. 
I guess I'd been deceived. Because a voice inside kept telling me that oh, I'd change by and by. But the Spirit made it clear to me, that kind of life's a lie. I have decided. I'm going to live like a believer. Turn my back on the deceiver. I'm going to live what I believe. That night in the car, I acknowledged that it's not enough to believe that God exists. I needed to choose between following the heavenly creator who loved me enough to come as Jesus to save me and the other fraudulent gods that I also ran after. I sang that song out loud as my prayer, as my pledge of allegiance, as my covenant to Christ. I believe in God. No more compromises. No turning back. It was a costly decision, but it was an obvious decision. It was the best decision I ever made. That's the spirit of the Apostles' Creed. It's not to be said in drone repetition, but as a revolutionary declaration of independence from other authorities or agendas and a passionate pledge of allegiance to God's kingdom instead, which includes allegiance to the community of other revolutionaries making the same vow. It's the start of a revolution that begins in us. We change. We grow. The battle may continue in my soul, but the balance of power has changed forever. As a result, when we recite the Apostles' Creed in our congregation this fall, we won't begin with the traditional formula, Christian, what do you believe? As if our faith is a list of facts. Instead, we'll begin with a question that directs our attention to the revolutionary and relational spirit of what we're declaring. Christian, in whom? Do you believe? And we'll recite it together because it doesn't just describe our relationship with God, but is the foundation of our commitment to each other and to the mission that God's given us, even when those commitments feel costly. Each week, we'll study this creed so that we can better understand what we're pro proclaiming. But comprehending it more fully is only a tool that helps us commit more fully. If you believe in God, but have never made the decision to trust in him, to forsake all other allegiances and follow him, do that right now. Because in this series, your pastors don't just want to instruct you in the historic doctrines of the church. We want to inspire you to live a life built on the reality of who God is, what he's done, and what he's promised to do in the future. We want to inspire you to be lovers of the truth and servants of those who suffer. We're a part of a revolution, and we won't give up or back down until our Father's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. What would it mean for you to declare, I believe with your life? Perhaps as you respond to pressure to, to fudge data in an academic paper or financial sheet, or deal with your own finances, or make career decisions, relationship decisions, respond during an argument, or, or sit alone in front of a computer late at night. What would it mean to not only believe the authority of God the Father, but also trust in the power of the Holy Spirit to enable us to obey? and to seek forgiveness through Jesus when we fall short. If you're not yet a follower of Christ, my goal in this series is not simply to convince you of the reasonableness of our ideas about God. I want to introduce you to our Creator and Savior, people have gotten to know through a hundred generations. I want to inspire you to live differently as you increasingly trust our Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, I want you to fall in love with the living God. That is my dream for all of us this fall.